Thank you, Greg. Um, again, I'm Kimiko. Um, I'm an assistant professor for Berkeley Center for New Media, and but also for School of Information. Um, so today, I'm honored to present to you two speakers. Um, and after their talk, I'll have a quick synthesis. So first speaker is Nicholas Nova. Nicholas is a professor at the Geneva University of Arts and Design and founder of the ne Near Future Laboratory, uh, laboratory sorry, uh, design studio based in Europe and here in California. Nicholas has given talks and exhibited his work on the intersections of design, technology, and the near future possibilities for new social te socio technical interaction rituals. So without further ado, um, please welcome Nicholas Nuva. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I started uh, thinking about my presentation with this, I mean, the overarching topic of this uh, conference and other events this week in, uh, in the Bay Area, which is about the future of the book. And what I'm interested in when it comes to the future of the book is to take a sort of a uh, well, a different perspective than, than this uh, QR code. Uh, the reason why I'm interested in, in going beyond the QR code is that as uh, we see people talking about the evolution of text, book, and the role of digital technologies in uh, well, book and textual uh, production, QR codes are kind of perv pervasive and omnipresent, and I want to explore uh, a different kind of, um, of, of perspective. And in order to do that, I'm going to make a, a, a short detour uh, with a different uh, field in, in, the, um, in art and look at, um, at music and how the music, uh, uh, musical production changed with uh, digital technologies. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with this kind of, uh, of device. It's been produced uh, by a Japanese company called Casio back in the 80s, Casio was uh, doing uh, pocket calculators and wanted to go into the music uh, industry. And there was this, uh, uh, this guy working, this engineer working at, uh, at the company, uh, developing these uh, small uh, keyboards from the, it's called Casio Tone, the, uh, the, the brand that Casio used uh, for this. And, and the guy was uh, crazy of uh, this American uh, singer, uh, Eddie Cochran. And it was so crazy about, about him that when designing this, uh, this uh, machine, he created a, a, a preset uh, that tried to replicate uh, the uh, Eddie Cochran song. And interestingly, a uh, few years later uh, in uh, Jamaica, different country, uh, you have people playing with this device, changing the, ch changing the, the well, preset, the bass, and, and the and the drums and it led to a very well important song in Jamaica and then in different uh, countries and interestingly you have people now in uh, the uh, eastern part of uh, Germany uh, reusing this kind of this kind of material and turning all old, old machines into uh, devices to produce this very strange form of reggae music that is played with uh, Commodore 64 uh, uh, computers reshaped as uh, the machines so of course, this is kind of different than thinking about books, but there's something interesting in there uh, that I, I'm, I call machine creolization. So the term creolization comes from uh, different, different fields, mostly uh, linguistics. And it's the idea that uh, different uh, cultural elements could be mixed and uh, entangled in a way that something new and original is produced. And what is interesting at this, uh, I mean, with the... Uh, so-called digital revolution is that digital technologies, computers, algorithms play an important role in this kind of uh, realization process. And, and this, uh, I call this mixing of cultural elements with uh, an increasing role of uh, technology uh, machine realization. And that's the starting point for, uh, for me to think about what, what does it mean for text, for textual productions, for fictions, for novels, uh, when you have this kind of phenomenon happening that is similar to what happened in the music uh, uh, production. So you have different, different possibilities. And of course, uh, machine-generated text are uh, uh, an interesting possibility. It, it, it exists for quite some time. You have people working on algorithms that produce poetry or that produce uh, fictions. There are a lot of artists working on this uh, in, the last, in the last 20 years. But interestingly, you now have 
uh, companies and startups like uh, Narrative Science that try to turn the massive amount of data generated by uh, sensors, open data, uh, different databases, and turn that into uh, a way that uh, texts could be could be produced by by machines. And, uh, an interesting example is how sports account. I mean, if you have a, a soccer game and you want to create a sort of uh, summary of what happened, they can provide you with the technology to do that. Same with uh, financial account of uh, well trading options and, and, and things like this. But interestingly, and that's, that's something that uh, is pointed out by uh, this American artist called Kenneth Goldsmith, that that's, that's one thing. You, you can have computers writing poems. You can have uh, machines generating text like this. But what does it mean when you have things like a uh, network object or the Internet of Things, when you have a fridge that is connected to the Internet, when you have tons of uh, machines that are connected and then can produce uh, uh, data. Can you, can you use that as a way to create new forms of text? That, that may seem a little bit weird, but from an uh, I mean, art perspective, that's, that's intriguing and interesting to have machines producing data and turning the data into something that is original, meaningful, curious, as a textual form. So what does it mean in terms of uh, the output? What would that uh, produce? Uh, you have people working on this kind of log file poetry. Uh, there's this, uh, this guy, Martin Hose, who uh, created this very thick book. It's a 400 pages uh, book that is basically a huge log file of his uh, laptop and all the messages the laptop produce uh, during a day. So obviously this is a day in the life of a laptop. Which is, I mean, it's kind of um, intriguing. It's mostly uh, URL and, and, and Unix command lines. It, it feels a bit strange, but of course, it's, it's, you can understand that if you know the vernacular language of, uh, of computers. Another example, and that's uh, a project I'm, uh, I'm working on with the, the Near Future Laboratory, is it's a, a book made of uh, hexadecimal files. So if you play video games, and if you played video games back uh, in the 80s, uh, you know that you can, uh, you can access to this. You can use the, the, the saved game file and try to change those, those weird codes and see what happened in, in the game. And by doing that, you understand the, the, the vernacular language of machine. And this project is basically a compilation of all my attempts to save a princess in the game Super Mario Brothers, which is also totally absurd and, and weird if you, if you look at the, the, the text like this. It's mostly uh, letters and, and numbers. But interestingly, this is a sort of tribute to the people uh, back in the 80s or still now are trying to understand what, what it means. And of course, uh, by looking, by tweaking, by changing these letters and uh, playing the game afterwards, you can understand what happened. What are the, the changes that you created by changing the, the, this, this kind of language? And by changing this, you learn how to understand the, the computer. And you can, hopefully, it might be interesting to apply that to other things. Uh, there's a guy who uh, played Civilization, the um, strategy game, for 10 years. So he let his computer playing for, for 10 years, and it created weird uh, countries and, and weird civilization with, which attacked each other. And that, that's, I mean, one direction that I'm interested in is how this, how the huge log file produced in those 10 years can be turned into an anthology or uh, a sort of Wikipedia encyclopedia of the, that, that word by algorithms uh, that can detect what has, what has been created by the machine and turned into a fiction, a fictional universe. So that's, that was basically uh, a sort of machine-produced produ uh, uh, sort of a text. So what would it mean to go beyond that and try to think about new forms of human-machine collaboration in which you don't just have the machine producing uh, all those weird data, but you have people trying to curate or to uh, use this data and turn this into something a bit more meaningful that, uh, than what I've uh, presented before. So there's this project that uh, we are pursuing in the near future laboratory with my colleague uh, uh, Fabien Giardin and Julian Blicker who are in, in this room. And it's um, uh, a project that we call Me Memento. And, and the idea is to collect data coming from uh, different data sources like Flickr, Instagram, Twitter, and put that in some sort of uh, pool 
on, 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 um, on the, the computer and, and turn that into a, bro a book production service that would lead to this kind of, uh, of book where you can, after you go on vacation, you can, that's obviously an important use case, you can turn that into a sort of compilation of your vacation, like you have the, the picture you've chosen for the title, you have a map that can be generated, extracted from the, uh, the, the, the Foursquare or the location-based service you used. You have pictures and quotes coming from Twitter, and all of this is the result of a collaboration between the data generated by the, the different services one could use on his uh, smartphone, and then some form of curation by the author of this, uh, of this book. Another project I'm interested in is um, it's the equivalent to what I just presented, but with fictions. Uh, so I guess in, in the US you're familiar with this uh, 3.11 Twitter account. There's one in, um, in Venice Beach where I, I lived uh, last year. And that's the, in this Twitter account, you can see all the, the problems going on in real time. If there, you have someone running naked on the street with a gun or crazy things, crazy things like this. And if, I mean, uh, if you look at this, it's a series of sort of uh, micro dramas uh, in, in, in the city that appears uh, on a regular basis. So the idea is to use the same platform as what I presented to collect uh, data like uh, tweets from this uh, Twitter account, pictures coming from Flickr, and try to uh, produce, to generate a book based on this microdrama, microdrama uh, would be like this. You would have uh, the description of, uh, of what happened on the tweets, and by looking at the different uh, location, you can go look on Flickr, the picture that corresponds to this, and create, uh, not automatically, but with some form of human intervention, you can create this kind of, of book that is meant to reflect the microdrama happening uh, in uh, Venice, uh, California. Other people are going beyond that and are curious about what it means to have a sort of algorithmic uh, production that engages new forms of collaboration between human and machine. Uh, Tromavine, uh, which is a very interesting uh, art collective in, um, in uh, Austria, did this uh, Ghostwriters uh, project um, a few, I think it was last year. And the idea, is, the idea is that you have an algorithm, a bot, that automatically scrap content on YouTube. They take the YouTube comments, they create a Kindle book, and they sell the Kindle book on Amazon. And of course, Amazon is pissed because they take that as, as spam. Obviously, the content is intriguing. They focus on SpongeBob, SquarePants, uh, Kindle books, and Justin Bieber. Uh, of course, that's also very uh, absurd, and, 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 and who wants to read that uh, is, a, is a very important question. But more importantly, what, what is intriguing here is that you have a new forms of cultural production that is partly uh, taken care of by, by algorithms and, and, and computer bots that can scrap content somewhere, create, create a book, and sell it on Amazon. And that's, I mean, that's, that's, a, funny, that's a funny example, but if you look at academic production and, and you look at certain kind of books uh, on, uh, on, Wiki, on, uh, sorry, on Amazon, they basically use the same kind of thing. They scrap content on Wikipedia, turn this into a, a book, like a manual, which is very badly done and with a very weird uh, graphic design, but it's sold on Amazon afterwards. And Amazon has to solve this kind of spam or find a way to deal with this kind of spam-related production of text by algorithms. Um, another example of uh, textual production by a collaboration between human and machine is, is, is this project called The Descriptive Camera by uh, a designer called Matt Richardson. And it's uh, basically a camera that takes a picture, send the picture on Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, a crowdsourcing platform where you can uh, ask people to do certain tasks for, I mean, there are very basic tasks and you can pay them a very short amount of money. So the, the camera takes a, the picture, send it on Amazon Mechanical Turk, ask people to give a textual description of what is on the, on the picture, send it back to the, the camera and print it on this very tiny roll of paper. So it's basically a, a descriptive camera, a, a textual form of uh, pictures. That, that's also funny and, and, and a bit absurd, but the, the, the sort of collective, uh, the sort of collaboration you have between machines, algorithm, and human in this is very intriguing. It's, an, it's an, also an, a, a new form of textual production that 
could be expanded to different domains. And last type of example is, and as you see in, in my presentation, we go from the very machine uh, produced text to more uh, human produced uh, text. We have the role of the author that is more important to, uh, uh, as we go to, to the end. So you have machine-like text produced by, by people. And this is an intriguing example, the uh, uh, Hamlet fa Facebook uh, newsfeed edition by uh, an artist called Serge Schmeling, who did this sort of uh, remediation of Hamlet in the form of uh, a Facebook uh, interface, which is also uh, absurd and, and, and intriguing, but that's, that's, that's a way to see how, how human, pe human authors remediate uh, things, and that's more like a joke, of course. But you have people going beyond that. You have this uh, collective of uh, game designers led by uh, Lena Polanski and uh, this uh, guy that I don't remember the first name, um, called Ghost in the Machine. And it's, it's a series of, um, of uh, short stories based on the, the glitches and the, the problems and the imperfection you have in video games. And they tell this story by using these imperfections that you have in video games as a form of a, a metaphor to tell the story. It's not, it's not produced by the machine. It's just that they, they take the inspiration in the way machines make uh, mistakes in the game and turn that into uh, a narrative, and a, a new form of uh, storytelling, which is kind of interesting in this uh, with regards to this notion of network realism, where you authors try to take the inspiration in, in the way networks and, and computers work and, and behave. And last, last uh, type of, um, of example uh, in which I'm, uh, for which I'm interested in, with regards to this kind of machine creolization that I started with, is how reading uh, text can change because of an uh, algorithm. So. There are examples, there are many examples like, like this one, and this is from one of our students at the design school in Geneva, uh, where you can read a comic book, and by using your uh, smartphone on top of the comic book, you can have, you can have additional content that is, uh, that, that is triggered by different shapes on the, the comic book. There's no QR code, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. And there are different, different kind of design collective working on this this type of augmented, um, augmented reading uh, capabilities that, uh, capability that is allowed and, and enabled by uh, algorithm. Uh, in a similar kind of way, you have uh, location-based books. It's basically books that you can read in different places, and depending on the place where you read the book, the story or certain kind of elements in the, in the story might change depending on, on where you are. And it's based on this idea that you might uh, simply read something different depending on the place you want to read the, the book. And that's, that's also that, that's intriguing. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's a huge value in the book that is featured on this, uh, on this slide, but probably that's an interesting direction to understand how uh, external data like location, uh, weather data, um, the number of time you read a book can reshape the reading experience. And you can envision a book where, uh, depending on the weather, uh, the content might be different. You can imagine a book uh, where if it's the third time you read the book, it's different because the book detected that it's the third, third time that you read it. And, and you can create a, a, a sort of new experience in a new form of relationship between the reader, uh, its context, and the book content uh, itself. Um, other example that I, I find intriguing is the, the way, um, especially in the field of um, digital humanities, people are trying to understand and provide new kind of metaphors for book content. This is a, a project uh, done by uh, Yannick Rocha and uh, Frédéric Kaplan, uh, two researchers from the Swiss Institute of Technology in, in Lausanne in Switzerland. And what they did is basically put the, the whole collection of uh, Rousseau's uh, Confessions, very thick series of uh, volumes. And what they wanted to uh, explore is the, the social network of the characters in this book. And, and what, they, what they did with the analysis, they, they built an algorithm that scrapped the content and analyzed the content, the relationship between the characters. And th it generated this sort of social graph, uh, the equivalent of Facebook social graph, that 
replicate the uh, evolution of the social network in all of the different uh, confessions by uh, Rousseau. And you can see uh, the evolution of the, the, the connection between the characters. That's interesting, of course, from an academic perspective. But that's also intriguing in, in terms of, uh, of book writing as a, as a metaphor for uh, providing a new point of entry in the book. If you, if you think about books like uh, Lord of the Rings or any kind of uh, fantasy-like book, it's, it's like uh, a mandatory thing to have a map at the beginning of, uh, of the book. So is the social network a new equivalent of the map in the Lord of the Rings? Could there be things like this where you have because of the algorithms, you have new representation that help you or lead you to discover the content of a book in a, in a different way. Uh, an interesting case for this is uh, the work done by Stephen Thiel, who did this Understanding Shakespeare uh, project. And he, he created this book, uh, it, and it's very similar to the project I've sh uh, shown before, where you have uh, for different Shakespeare uh, uh, texts like Macbeth, you have a, a sort of analysis and a, a very uh, interesting representation of the, the plots, the narrative, and, and the connection between characters and events in, in the book. And that's, I mean, I don't necessarily mean here that the future is about having tons of data visualization in, in, in books and, and novels. But what would it mean to, if you replace the, uh, the map at the beginning of Lord of the Rings with this kind of a representation? How your experience of understanding the evolution of the characters, their, uh, uh, the, the plot, the, their, um, their discovery of the, the fantastic universe described in the book, how this would be influenced by such kind of uh, representation. And uh, as, as a conclusion, uh, as a way to frame this, the, to wrap up this kind of uh, discussion, I want to end with this, uh, this quote from um, this uh, writer from uh, Martinique, uh, one, of the, one of the French islands in, uh, in the Caribbean, who wrote this, uh, this quote back in the, in the 90s, uh, a very, very forward uh, thinking and very anticipatory uh, vision where it says basically, okay, as, 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 as writers, as authors, people are interested in having computers, I like the expression, coughing up uh, poetry. Uh, and he links that to uh, other type of writers interested in randomness, in the use of, well, dice, for instance, which refers to Stéphane Mallarmé's uh, work. But he, he can conclude with this very interesting uh, uh, notion that writers of the future is, uh, well, partly a computer scientist, but also Rimbaud, the French poet, who uh, tried to go beyond, beyond language and try to find new ways of expression using uh, the tools of his time. And, and basically what, what he means here, I think that the way I translated uh, with regards to this machine creolization, hybridization that I, that I mentioned is that you can have a difference, well, a whole spectrum between uh, machine or non-human productions of, uh, of text and human production of text. But what's maybe the, the most intriguing part is the collaboration between uh, human and computers in a way that you can generate new forms of metaphor, you can uh, extract meaning from, from data and use that as a starting point from something uh, fictional. And there's no, I mean, there's no, there's not just one way. There are different possibilities that are interesting to, uh, to combine. And we'll see more and more things 